um, and everything else is coming downstream. So that um, has been, I've had many pharmacists now talking about this stuff and wanting to get into a space, but it's actually not that quite new. I would probably say it's maturing, but it's been around for six years plus at this point in time, at least in the current uh, status. So in general, we have some objectives, I think, for you guys, and I'm just going to gloss over those. So let's just talk about this. I'm going to go through five areas of interest for me, like why and why is this now coming to a forefront? And what does this mean for healthcare overall, especially in the pharmacy practice side? And the one thing I think we can establish is this is a wireless world. And when we think about this, just think about this past year. How many of you didn't see each other? You were Zooming on with other people. And the fact that you could say Zoom like that, instead of just saying like you're having a teleconference call, establishes how much into or basically lexicon that this has become a kind of default for us. We have Uber, you have DoorDash, you have everything out there to get to your home. There's the Amazonification of business and life itself where I want something and I just go on my phone and I just hit a few things, connect a credit card, I'm gonna get a service delivered to me right away. And at the end of the day, the mobile devices and such has basically brought to the forefront that life itself is, this is what it is. We live in an environment unless there is a global catastrophe that I cannot see greatly change where we do not live in a very mobile first society. And I want you to keep that in mind. We are mobile first. We are very much electronic first. And even think about this, like we, um, this whole presentation is on digital health. Digital health what? We don't call it digital banking. You just call it banking now. That took about 20 years to come to fruition. This whole digital health kind of stuff popping up, it's just kind of an interim term. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go forward is that you're living in a very transition, transitory period, especially for a digitalization of healthcare overall. So when people say digital health, to me, it's just an interim phase because eventually it'll just become healthcare. But it's because of this mobile first emphasis. And at the end of the day, you really have to ask yourself, what can't you do with technology? What can't we reach for? What can't be conducted? Um, one thing I often ask myself, all the time is what happens actually after the smartphone. Like we're, we, we focus on this device so much. We think about this interface, this user interface, this user experience around a touch base or voice activated software through a device that we carry on our, in our pocket. And we actually care about how long this charge connectivity lasts, whether or not we're in wireless range and such to function. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't function anymore. But what actually comes after this is gonna be a question. And as a digitalized society moves on, Will there be, be other ways that we kind of utilize this stuff? I don't know if it's going to be hardware, software, or such, but it's something that's definitely in my mind. Probably not for another 10 to 15 years, into me, at least at this current time. You know, so as we talk, establish that digitalization is going to be the natural thing that's going to occur, then we have to ask, you know, how does this actually change how our patients actually integrate with health? And the thing that always stands out to me is like, you look at 80% of people are going to look up information on, on the internet. And this to me has always been very much a huge dividing factor in terms of traditional roles of healthcare professionals versus the now. So in the past, if you want to health information, you had to go to the library or you called a pharmacist or you talked to your provider because they were either someone you have access to for free or you pay for a service or you go look for yourself. With the advent of the internet back in the uh, you know, widespread in the late 1990s, you then had this boom of people putting information online. And that has only slowly grown in terms of the amount of content out there and how that content's delivered. So if it comes to a point where in our conversations, we would just wiki and look things up and just establish information online to get that, I think if we see that as the natural way that most people, especially younger generations, utilize technology, that's gonna be the default as we move on. The other thing to also consider is the fact that many of us are actually engaging in health tracking devices. Um, even if you look at employer-based care, almost 70% of employees or employee members would actually use a mobile device given by their employer to track their health, especially if you can anonymize it and then use it for better mental health and workplace um, health outcomes in the businesses. So many people are really getting into the tracking of these devices. I think the biggest uptake though was with the development of the smartwatches. The initial devices, whether it was the Jobbles, Echo Fuel Bands, um, the Fitbits, were just to me smart pedometers and their battery life and such was actually a huge risk and people had a huge drop off on them. But when you actually got to a new interface where you had a device that not only could do things for communication and such, but also track health, 
I think that's actually what made this mature much further. And we're actually seeing this still have a steady increase. And we're seeing some places actually go full board with this. We just talked about Singapore being a nation state actually giving all their people um, like an Apple, uh, Apple Watch, especially if it could be potentially used to track the pandemic and actually determine whether or not from digital biomarkers that you could track if someone actually coming down with an infection. That's been a huge discussion point recently. Coming back to accessing um, information online, one of the things that stands out to me is just the role of things in social media and video. TikTok, um, Instagram, and such have played a huge role in people getting medical information. We've seen it for pros and cons, especially during the ongoing pandemic and how people are reacting to vaccines. One thing that stands out to me though, is that there's some great literature out, out there about how people use uh, medication devices, whether that's an inhaler or insulin or auto injectors. So patients would rather go to YouTube to look up instructions of how to use their medications and inject themselves. Interestingly, when you actually look at those videos and watch how many of them are actually done by patients themselves, and you watch how they tell other people to inject, almost over uh, almost 30% of them are actually incorrect. So there's a downstream effect where people actually would prefer to get information from their peers or so-called peers or people suffering from similar conditions, but they run the risk of actually getting the wrong information. And you know we can go into the whole behavioral psychology, why people prefer those things and not train towards medical professionals for their information and such, and how there are adjunctive models of basic information being given. I mean, I could come back to the same. I mean, I'm a social professor, so I teach in a classroom through didactic lectures. There's some professors in here, I'm sure. And we're all cognizant of the fact that students also turn towards online information to help them understand material that maybe the professors didn't give them as well as they could have. So think about that analogy. What would you do as a student? Is the same thing patients would do. You may come to the point and say, you know, I'm the pharmacist, why don't they trust me? But it's a very similar thing that People want that access to information online. It's maybe the ease of convenience and such. And to me, I think that's one of the biggest things is that there is a consumerization of care and what people want. Because at the end of the day, if you can say to yourself, if I can order my food on and go, why can't I get my medications? Why can't I just talk to someone on the couch? Why do I have to drive to the provider office, sit in a waiting room, put on a weird outfit and sit there for like 45 minutes till someone comes into me, looks at the computer and asks me a bunch of questions and says, okay, you're good to go. Go get labs, go get testing and go pick up your medications. Like, is that a great experience? If that's going to be the default experience, then I'm going to shop around for an experience that at least meets those needs from my own comfort. And I think that's where we're seeing this huge movement towards the era of retail health. We're seeing this with Walmart, with Amazon, with a bunch of the current incumbent pharmacy groups. And I think this was just a natural thing coming because when we look at some of the big three players traditionally, whether it was CVS Health, Rite Aid, Walgreens, and we look back for the past almost 20 years, there has been this consolidation slowly building over time where things are going into a very definitive vertical pipeline where patients will have access to their insurance, to PBM markets that, you know, assign costs and such, to a pharmacy and now to a care network. And these uh, patients will be locked down into these centers. And if we think about that, if we take into consideration that it's inevitable that many people will end up in one of these vertical pipelines for care, cost driver is gonna be the biggest things. How do you reduce cost? And this may be a conversation going to economics and such, but if you think about like employer health and that many Americans get health benefits through some form of employment, and their family members, we have seen a steady increase of deductibles. We've seen an increase of how much people are paying for premiums of their healthcare, whether through PPPO or whether through an HMO. And with employers, what they're actually looking at now, especially after the pandemic, is how do we turn towards digital tools? How do we turn towards digital services to actually meet our member needs and actually offset the cost they traditionally would have? That's actually one of the reasons why telehealth has done pretty dang well is the fact that it's actually from a payment scheme has actually reduced the cost for a lot of these employers and such, but has actually increased scalability and access to care that traditionally their, their members would not have. So what you should take away from all this is that, you know, we established it's gonna be mobile first. We established that patients want mobile and want that kind of thing. And also the payers, the different companies, healthcare as a whole really acknowledges the fact that 
this is the entire environment that they have to function in. And that it's actually leads to some cost savings. It increases more access and more, you know, reasonable care amount. And these are the factors I think that all together are really pulling this into fruition. It's not like people are saying like, okay, you know, suddenly we want to just have access to this technology and that's going to be a default. No, it's actually a bunch of different forces that are working together to make this actually come to fruition. So patients have tons of access to uh, direct-to-consumer model businesses that are building up, whether it's Roe, Hims as an example. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones that are online, uh, New Rx and Nurx, access for birth control and such. Don't you have to go see a provider. You can just see one on your phone and screen out questions and then get a medication delivered to your home. Again, it's the fact that people want convenience to access health on their own terms, not on ours. You've probably heard, you know, you know, the whole conundrum between paternalism of healthcare, you know, having a provider at the top and everyone else. I would say it's going to be, it's flipping actually over where the patient now chooses as long as they have the financial incentives and ability to what they want and where they're going to go. And even payers and such are going to kind of give a buffet effect where people be like, you know what, you want to choose this kind of health benefit, this kind of thing, this is how you want to gauge your health, you want to use a wearable device, fine, we're going to go for that. Because the benefit of the data they'll get back to use to drive out better outcomes, hopefully in the longer range, is going to play off for them. So this is why we're now entering what I would say is the era of digital health. So many people think of digital health, you know, initially like, you know, it's sensors, it's mobile apps, there's telehealth, there's the use of artificial intelligence, um, new software, voice assistance, robotics, and automation. So most people just come in and say, oh, it's just all this, this is digital health, this is a technology. Everything I talked about before is why digital health can function. There's multiple stakeholders at play. There's patients, there's providers, and there's payers. And unless you can satisfy all three, at the end of the day, none of this is going to be worth it. So this is why even people who want to get into stars, who want to so-called disrupt healthcare, you have to keep in mind the users, people who will prescribe care, and the people who are going to pay for care. And the fact that the payers are very interested in this, patients are very interested in, in this, this then comes to this conversation with us as pharmacists, we therefore have to be interested as well because the market is shaping towards embracing this. If you're not digital first, you will lose. That's going to be the natural thing that's going to go on for any other conversation out there. We've seen it with other businesses. You see Sears and everything else closing in the malls. We see malls, shopping areas having huge trouble. And, you know, people are always going to say, you know, it's brick and mortar versus online. Well, people are also calling it, you know, brick and click. It's a utilization of having a physical location alongside a digital front door to bring consumers in. And I think that's going to be the happy, magical language where you have to have a digital service or a digital front door for your, uh, your health uh, services and such, whether it's an app or such, but also still have a physical capability to address patient care. Um, and, you know, again, I talked about how much wearables are being used. Uh, we look at different populations. I still truly don't think digital health takes off for another decade. I think the next five to 10 years are going to be huge discussions, but mainstream, not quite so. And the reason I would say that is the biggest thing is people always going to come back and say, oh, you know, older adults don't like this stuff and seniors. We're not designing a lot of this stuff for this population, to be quite honest. Um, we're aiming actually for the aging adults and worried well, because these populations, at least if we look about the late 40s, early 50s, know how to use digital services and such. And we've seen them use the telehealth and such. So we know they can adapt to it and get into it. This population here is not going to be kind of our real big concern. Um, to be frank, I've heard some people say, you know, the shelf life for this population is not worth the investment. It's this right here that you're aiming for, because as long as you get the technology developed in the next 10 years, when they get older enough, they are encumbered with enough chronic conditions, they will be wrapped to utilize these services. So that is going to be overall market shaping, landscaping that you're going to see in conversations within at least heavily in the next five years as people talk about this stuff and using telemedicine, using digital tracking, things like that. One thing that's standing out to me is I would argue we are moving from an era of intermittent care to real-time care then because of this. And what I mean by intermittent care, think about the last time you've seen a provider. When was the last time you've had a physical? Um, maybe not for a while. And you think about, okay, what do you do? You stop and go, stop and go. You go see someone, they tell you to go get labs, do this, follow up in so much amount of time, do it, change it, 
go back, reassess. So it's always like, duh, 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 duh. and it's the reality is, you know, especially if you're training as a pharmacy student, is thinking about subjective versus objective information. When do you get that flow of information? When can you assess it? And when you, can you utilize it? Some information falls in between that you can look at. But the reality is that our care model is very intermittent in practice. But think about patients. There, there's 365 days in the year, right? And if they spend maybe five days actually going out to see someone for their health, and within that day, it's only a few, an hour, the touch points are really, to be quite honest, in health, pretty low. And when we get to the point where you, we acknowledge the fact that we have all these new devices and stuff out there that can actually assess health in real time, this just blows up. Now, we have data overload almost, I would say, and I'm going to come back to that, where we have data all the time about people in terms of how their health day in, day out, minute to minute is actually functioning. And there's been some concerns about this. Uh, one of the big ones was the Apple Health Study, I mean, Apple Heart Study that brought out the um, Series 4 Apple Watch that got FDA clearance or 510K clearance to track atrial fibrillation. And there's a huge concern amongst cardiologists that are getting a lot of false positives for people who have atrial fibrillation. I don't disagree with that, but the problem there is that you kind of will work yourself into a logic system where you say, this is the penultimate design aspect of this device. Apple didn't look at themselves and say, yeah, this is the best we're going to do. Rather, what Apple said is, we're going to get a lot of data from this. We can make the Apple Series 20 do much more. And that's why you're going to see smartwatches probably actually do a lot of things. So they're probably going to be doing blood glucose, blood pressure, and other data sensing technology. Is it going to be the best? No. But from a public health kind of criteria, it's going to be quite useful. It'll help you actually screen for people that probably wouldn't really have other conditions. And you could probably segue them into much more specific devices that are much better with their sensitivity and specificity. Those are things to consider. And it's quite interesting because we actually start getting other information that we never got in the past from this stuff. Take, for instance, with the EKG, people have investigated and are actually showing that you can actually, from an EKG, track blood glucose and serum potassium in real time from this. No more blood draws. We're getting new markers from data that we couldn't do before because we never had the real time assessment that we provided. How do we use this information? Where do we take it to the next level? This is kind of to me really quite interesting in terms of changing the paradigm of how we think about data, how we think about our medications and how we think about monitoring. Because we're seeing all these devices come downstream and we have continuous blood uh, pressure devices. This one's made from Omron, for instance. And then, you know, we have Freestyle Libre 14 day, Freestyle Libre 2, we have Dexcom 6. There's a Dexcom 7 coming out. There's a Freestyle Libre 3 coming out. We have real time continuous glucose monitoring coming to the market. Patients don't want to prick themselves in the fingers anymore. They just rather put on a device that tracks their blood sugar and lets them know, hey, you're doing a great job. Your time and range is amazing. Or, oh no, you're hypoglycemic and you need to do something now. Okay, that helps them. Payers love it because if it can reduce hospitalizations or ER visits, reduce that, great. If it leads to better A1C goals, great. That's what we want. And if this is a technology it takes to get there, people, Twenty twenties is this kind of movement. And it's only going to be because we have other access to things that we never did before. Home lab testing. We saw a huge conversation about this for COVID, but this has been going on for a long time. Doing urine tests at home, doing other point of care testing at home, other software. This is going to be a big, especially with how fast we can get products moved around the country from home to a lab testing center in less than 24 hours. Or if we can do stuff in the home directly. Yeah, that's going to be big. The FDA is very, very interested in this right now. And we saw one from Amazon just talked about the fact that they want to get into real-time home lab testing, especially because they want to pursue this hospital home model where you can use a lot of remote patient monitoring tools and devices like we just showed, also with the labs, so that you can have patients that you know may be ill, but they can still stay at home so they're going to the hospital unit floor just for that monitoring parameters. Voice assistance. This is going to be a big thing. Um, this is one that actually scares me to a certain extent because in terms of privacy and such, we're still learning. But, you know, we can just imagine, for instance, hey, you know, very basic. Did you take your medications today? Or we can go even further. And this is a patent, again, from Amazon. You know, I'm going to act it out a little bit. <clears throat> Alexa, <clears throat> I'm hungry. <clears throat> Would you like a recipe for chicken noodle soup? <clears throat> no, thanks. Okay. 
I can find something else. By the way, would you like to order cough drops with a one hour delivery? <clears throat> That'd be awesome. No problem. I'll email you an order confirmation. It'll be delivered to you within the next hour. Also, I've noticed you've been coughing for the past two days and based on flu rates replacing and COVID rates and everything else in your region, you may be at risk. Would you like to schedule a teleconsult with someone at this current time? We're gonna move where we have technology that's not only in the background monitoring us passively to see how we're doing, but then we'll actively intervene for some kind of associated health outcome or health reason. That to me is probably gonna be very, very interesting when we get to that point. What's to stop someone from saying, hey, you have a psychic detect voice and you just start an ACE inhibitor and within a time period, they say, you know, could this be an ACE induced cough, for instance? Who knows? I mean, that's the stuff that's really out there for, you know, what we could probably give, develop or go with. Robots in health, this is a big one. Some of you guys may have heard of Catalina Health. This is their Maybu product, um, which is in a home to help out with basically be almost a health, digital health coach. And I think that coaching aspect is very big. Again, it's not an active person, it's just being automized. And why is that? Because if you can get away with, you can solve short, uh, send texting. We know texting works for reminders about doing some other kind of outcome. And if it doesn't work and you move on to doing a virtual or digital coach that can help look at data from a person saying, hey, you're doing a good or bad job, if that doesn't work, and then you go to an actual person, you've now got much more of a personalized aspect of how to deal with patient care. One example I'll give you for in pharmacy that I thought was very interesting is that for discharge, many people do kind of the same medication discharge overall. You educate patients on their medications and such, but we have very actually poor data on how well they actually understand that information and to gauge you know, what level of education you go into. It's a time sink to be quite honest. And economically, it may not be very valuable if the time sink you put in for the payoff isn't there. So how do you scale that up? What if we hypothetically gave you a quiz through like a tablet or an app that can actually assess your, um, your knowledge base of your drugs, your disease and everything before discharge. And let's suppose you get hundred percent on that. You know, for pharmacy, they can say, well, this person knows everything about the medications they're supposed to. I'm gonna just go and check on them and ask any other questions they need. And you know, maybe five minutes of time there is needed versus this other person just failed their exam twice, even after being uh, remediated with a video showing them more information. So I need to go spend more time with that patient. It's that kind of stuff. It's taking that data and that information that we can automate to a certain point to actually get more personalized in the scale and this care for patients using this type of digitalization of, techno of health. Um, one area I think I always like to talk about, especially for pharmacists, is just the technology is changing the way we even approach medication management overall. Because um, this stuff, I think, is coming downstream much faster than most people appreciate. I mean, medications are a huge area for disruption. Some people say, you know, it's a $300 billion problem with adherence. That's not quite right. It's more likely around $300 billion plus, but around medication optimization, which most people say is adherence, but I don't think it's necessarily true. There's other drug-related problems out there that we could address and go into detail for. But let's just think about adherence. You know, how crazy can we get for adherence and what can we, what technology can we develop? There's a lot. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, there's everything from bioadjustable sensors, smart pill bottles, um, smart inhalers, smart insulin things. And this is, to me, this is just a small subset of the companies I've come across that are very interested in this space. And pharma themselves are getting very interested in it as well. So we're going to have smart drugs and they are on the market already. So we have, you, you have like a smart pill bottle here that lights up green and says, hey, take, take your medications. Um, and knows when you open a cap. Or you have a smart pill tray, and the pill tray you know, lights up and says, open up this. And if you don't open it with this time window, we're gonna alert someone. Uh, we go further, we can get like medication dispensers. You can get something that just pops out the pill. Or in this case, you could have something that actually has uh, the pills in a dispensing sheet that just rolls out. Hey, you know what's cool about this thing is you can actually do telehealth through this. You can actually press and say, call the pharmacy and actually talk to the pharmacist uh, through the device. Or you can even more, Interesting. I love this device. I think it's very, very cute. Um, it's Pilo or Priya, depending on you know which version you get. Little googly eyes that watches you. You can put it in the kitchen. It'll actually watch you. Uh, it can actually watch you take your medication. It dispenses them out, and it can actually track your other health. Like when did you eat dinner? What did you have for dinner? What's your blood glucose, etc. Like that. Um, we have other things we can do. We can put sensors in medication. Swallow the medication and actually tell if you actually ingested it. Um, smart inhalers bunch of those out there, actuations. What's quite fascinating about these things and these devices is I think they're actually showing that our mechanisms for actually providing patient education around how to use their devices is actually pretty bad. 
or that they need recurrent information actually given to them. Uh, some of the sensors have shown almost 80% of people using just a rescue inhaler or SABA use them inappropriately. For instance, in taking, they'll take one puff instead of waiting one minute, they'll take one puff and take another puff right back, be, uh, right after each other, for instance. Um, you have other ones that are being developed to help out with injectable uh, drugs. So those are also coming out to the market pretty quickly. And I think this data is quite useful because it allows us to provide a level of care that we never had in the past. If we take into account that we can track you know, how people use their medications and we can remotely monitor you know, how they are actually um, dealing with their health, especially for something that matters with like a drug. So like if they had the ability to let's say monitor heart rate and they were just recently starting a beta blocker and you can say, okay, they're taking a beta blocker appropriately. We can see it from coming out of the pill bottle, blah, 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 but they're becoming bradycardia. We see this, you know, that at least feedback for us, you know, maybe we need to back up on the dose instead of saying, you know, wait till their next follow-up and we hear that, oh, you know, feeling lightheaded, dizzy, um, I don't feel good, blah, blah, blah. We already know that coming in or we could intervene earlier. And I think the best analogy I can make is just like your car. How many of us, you know, would you want to drive around with your, your truck engine light or low oil or stuff like that? Like, do, would you feel safe about that? Would you want to continue operating? If we get to the point though, let's say for the human body, we can passively measure people's health and everything's fine. We know things are fine. Don't need to intervene. Clinically, we could say, you know, this person is good. They're on track to where they need to. Great. But if the data comes out, you know, and the check engine oil goes off for a person on something, let's say some kind of metric we care about associated with a medication or disease, then we know we need to intervene. And this is, goes back to that continuous care model because this is when we want to touch point. But we can only do this because this technology is reaching a point where we can actually capably grab this stuff. We never had this stuff in the past, at least not at this scale, not for so cheap. And this is really what's going to change a lot of things that's going to come up, you know. And the other things are going to come too is going to be uh, questionable is you know, who says this is drugs? What else could we offer? And who should be doing this? And what I mean by that is digital health is to me an umbrella term. There's many things that fall under digital health. Digital health has no official definition. Even the FDA doesn't adequately define what digital health is. Um, there's different levels you can say it's like digital medicine that falls under this umbrella, and then finally digital therapeutics. Um, Digital therapies to me is a very niche area, but it's basically almost evidence-based software that actually delivers some kind of health outcome or can prevent or manage or treat a disease, for instance. Uh, FDA was running this pre-certification model for quite some time. You can see some of the companies that were involved with it, Apple, Samsung, Fitbit, J&J, Paratherapeutics, Roche, Verily. Um, but a lot of people are trying to figure out how can we actually make, let's say, an app. Can we make an app I'm going to call it an app, but we should call them digital therapies. Can we make some kind of digital therapies that can actually help you achieve some kind of outcome all by itself? Maybe it's um, smoking cessation, maybe it helps out with substance use to, uh, disorder. And we've seen this because uh, the FDA has cleared several of these. We have, for instance, this recent reset, oh, uh, this comes out from PEAR and was the first digital therapeutic actually approved on in the United States back in 2017 for substance use disorder. Uh, which is basically virtual cognitive behavioral therapy. Other ones we have is, is Insilia. This one actually tracks your blood glucose if you have especially uh, teamed up with another device. And a provider can basically say, I want you to stay within this range of your blood glucose. And what it does is it tracks how much insulin you use, what's your blood glucose, and it will actually recommend changes in how much insulin to actually give yourself. And it calculates it based on the data being fed into it. Um, you don't need to have like a nurse call you what to do. The whole app automates itself and says, okay, based on these trends and such, go up this many units, back off this many units. We have other ones like Kaya, there's actually home physiotherapy, um, basically using the camera and different movements from the app, tracks you as you do physiotherapy at home. Some studies are actually suggesting it may be superior uh, because you can have it all the time instead of going to see a physical therapist. Other ones, this one got approved um, uh, last year by the FDA because of an emergency act for psych, but it's actually a ADHD uh, game. Um, you can download if you want on the Apple store. Uh, I think it's called Endeavor RX. And basically it's a gamification uh, kind of model where you play this and it's supposed to help as adjunctive treatment for uh, people with ADHD. Um, and this is what I mean. like questions for us as pharmacists. If you know someone has an issue, should you recommend a DTX on top of adjunctive for care? Um, 
how do we incorporate this? Even like, let's say a medication reconciliation process for us. If you have someone that comes to the hospital or to a different clinic and say, oh, you know, I'm on this, but I'm also on an app that doses my insulin or I'm on a device that tracks my inhaler use, or I actually use this virtual cognitive behavioral therapy to help me out with my substance use disorder. Do you discontinue that? Do you continue it? Uh, does someone else take over for it? Do they even have access to that data? These are things that we don't know. And this is where I think, this is why I say the next five, 10 years is gonna be quite interesting how it develops and even our role as a profession in terms of handling it. And that's also gonna come down to our accessibility. A lot of this stuff either comes with software or hardware that has to be set up. If we have smart, injectable devices, take for instance, smart insulin pens that come to market. Are we as pharmacists responsible at the point of dispensing for setting this up? Does that mean helping a patient download an app and syncing that um, smart insulin pen for them? Or are they gonna do it on their own? Or if they have trouble with it, are they gonna call the pharmacist a provider? They call a tech company? Things for us to consider, especially for workflow management and for the data that will come across. So I think at the end of the day, this means that we really need to question how do we incorporate all this no novel technology and information into basically, you know, pharmacy itself as a profession. Um, so I think re-envisioning pharmacy service can be very key. I think one of the things that we always will hear talked about is that people will say, you know, data is a new oil. I, I, I don't like saying like data is a new oil by itself because to be quite honest, data by itself is like crude. I mean, oil itself is crude. You don't take oil out of the ground, you put it in your car, unless you want to kill your car. It goes to a refinery, gets turned into something else that can then be used. And that's why I think for us as pharmacists, we're in a great position to be the refiners of a lot of this digital data that's coming to the forefront. I think we can incorporate a lot of real-time information from these devices and services to actually leverage patient care. Because you know what? I feel like you, if you talk to a lot of these tech companies, startups and such, they always feel like they need to target providers. They need to go after like a physician and say, hey, you want access to all this data, right? And almost every physician I talk to says, no, I don't want this because it's just another thing my workflow is gonna drive me insane. I mean, if we think about this, for instance, what if we could think about medication management and endpoints and for efficacy and safety? Um, cardiology and, and basic cardiometabolic overall and diabetes are gonna be the two areas I see a huge emphasis on. Also with uh, pulmonary, most of the providers probably don't wanna know, oh, my patient took their inhaler correct today. No, or they didn't take it correct today. So when do I intervene? Do I intervene now? Do I intervene when they have an exacerbation, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, who wants to take over this information? One area I would probably emphasize that I think really stands out to me is hypertension management. I truly meant, uh, believe hypertension can be managed by pharmacists for the majority of stuff. And I think with the increase of showing the receptiveness of pharmacists in certain scenarios, that 24 hour blood pressure monitoring can be done efficiently in that tele-management of blood pressure is pretty easy to do. I would say that this is an area that we can get into. Now there's gonna be problems with that is that we have companies like Livongo out there that really are trying to uh, take this market on their own. And the question I kind of get into is, do, does that mean for us as pharmacists that go down this road, uh, this route towards like telemedicine and telemanagement of patients with their medications, do we start looking at positions in these kind of tech companies? Do we start looking at jobs like Amada or do we start seeing like CVS, Walgreens or Walgreens, especially with their collaboration with Village uh, MD, um, is that like a, an environment where we will be working and do remote patient monitoring, help out and take on this data overload for the providers to actually guide therapy based on different algorithms of choice or collaborative practice agreements that will pop up because of this. These are things I think are in flux because again, coming back to this whole environment working into we're, we're moving away from this current health monitoring parameter that is very much intermittent towards an integrated service. The question for us that we have to figure out as a profession is what data do we want? How do we work with that data? And how do we intervene in a workflow that makes sense? And the workflow is trying to be figured out now. So this is a great time for us to be advocating for ourselves because as long as we can integrate into that workflow, we'll have a edge that we can compete on in going forward. If we do not, it's gonna be very hard for us to try to even force our way into this model. So this is something that I advocate for the profession. We need to be aware of this overall. Otherwise we get left out. Other things have to be considered is just different mechanisms of drugs that are coming down the pathways. What is pharma considering? What is other companies considering? Um, one of the things that I hear about a lot is the idea of 3D printed drugs. I think this is quite a way, but personalization of medications for use, a lot of people are really into this right now. There's a lot of investment money flowing into it. Um, 
It remains to be seen, would this fall into pharmacy compounding laws traditionally? Uh, would it fall under different rules? I'm not sure, but one area to keep in mind. We also see the growth of different kiosks and different uses of automation of medications being dispensed. I think that's one that's going to be an area that will see huge changes within this decade. Dispensing overall, I think from touch points from the pharmacist is going to drop substantially. And that's because, as I talked about the natural digitalization of anything else, this one's quite easy to take on. Ultimately, then, we need to be able to reach patients and how they consume media, goods, and such, and really think about how, as a profession, we fit into it, which is going to be much more personalizable, I think. We're going to have to have kind of a different viewpoint of how we engage with consumers. And I hate saying it, but if we keep saying patients, 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 the reality is they're patient consumers. This consumer mindset we really need to get into and understand. We really need to figure out how to utilize new digital tools to provide patient care and stand out from other professions or another um, businesses that are truly really getting to the space. And you know, we need to leverage all this stuff that people really trust every day now. We're not getting away from a mobile first society. This is gonna be a default. Because at the end of the day, what I will tell you is that digital health eventually just becomes a part of healthcare. And if pharma is thinking beyond the pill, they're thinking how do we market technology and such, pharmacy themselves will have to think about, you know, think beyond the pill. We as a profession know that this is going to have to be the future. And I've laid out to you about all the different stuff and all the factors that are pulling us together. The questions that I deal with philosophically, and I think that for you, especially if you're beginning of your career or still in your career and starting to figure out where the profession is going, is we need to take into account what is this direction and what is the ramification of digitalization of our services and also change the dynamics of our consumerism of, of people. And, you know, how do current incumbents fit into the market? What do new uh, people, where are they gonna change for the market? I think those are things that stand out to me. So I think we have a few CE questions that we'll need to go through for as well for um, everyone. So I'm gonna keep the uh, chat um, open. Uh, let me just make myself go over here. Okay, um, so let me open the chat. First question is going to be, which of the following statements is most correct about digital health in the current United States healthcare landscape? A, payers are the key user group that lead technology development. B, digital health takes many forms based on settings and users. C, the advances of technology always match the clinical needs in practice. D, there's no guidance or regulations surrounding digital health tools. Feel free to just put in the chat what you think is the answer. Lots and B's and D's. So what I would say is regulation has really kicked up. Um, the FDA actually just this year launched their so-called Digital Health Center of Excellence. Um, it's gonna become a regulated in industry and there's gonna be some interesting rules that are gonna come out soon about it. So I would say B is actually the correct answer at this current time. Digital health takes many forms based on the settings and users. And this is gonna be subject to change over time, especially depending on what technology comes out. True or false, clinicians have a limited role in digital health tools due to the technology. Yeah, that one's an easy one, so false, good. Let's do a patient case. JC is a patient of yours recently discharged from the hospital for a heart failure exacerbation. You have been following their weight and blood pressure readings from a Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuff and scale. What type of digital health activity are you performing? A, remote patient monitoring. B, adherence tracking. C, disease-driven monitoring. D, continuous blood pressure tracking. So the answer is going to be A, remote patient monitoring. That's actually the official term right now, uh, often shortened as RPM. Um, last question is going to be, what is the potential role for pharmacists in a digital health-enabled health kit team? Uh, Provide patient education on utilization of digital therapies products, help the team select digital health products for patient care, review data from patient use of digital health products and guide therapeutic care, D, all the above. Was there one point D? Yeah, D is what I would believe. That's, that's where I'm at right now. Um, there's gonna be formulary guides. There's gonna be a lot of stuff coming downstream that I think we can help out to uh, develop and advise on. 
Um, so Madeline, just correct me if I'm wrong on this stuff. This was a CE information. And do you want me to do the claiming credit as a last slide? Yeah, if you could just put that slide up and then um, if anyone has any questions for you, they can drop them in the chat or unmute and ask. Um, but thank you so much for that presentation. It was very informative. No, thank you, I appreciate it. Hey, this is Dave, that was, uh, that was phenomenal. Uh, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to present today. And I'm sure there's many questions, but one that comes to mind um, would be, a, you know, kind of the elephant in the room, which is, you know, what should we be doing to uh, prepare our students to, you know, that are going to be pharmacists here in the near future? What should we be doing to prepare them for, for what's down the pike? So, how many, how many educators are in this room versus students, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I see quite a few of our faculties here. Okay, so I'm gonna go for a more faculty uh, derived answer. You have three options. One, you can either go track base. Two, you can just kind of just throw it in there willy nilly through an elective just to give it information. Or three, you could drive build it, building it to your curriculum. The last one's gonna be the hardest. I don't think anyone's there at this current point because I would say there's not that many digital health experts in the pharmacy faculty environment. Uh, AACP is currently looking into this, trying to figure it out. I do have a few publications published under FIP and also on PubMed, you'll find them, uh, talking about this. Uh, I've been mainly publishing with Robbie Patel, University of Pittsburgh on this topic because we've been trying to figure it out. But even if I was talking about digital therapeutics, if you were to ask, you know, mechanism of action with drugs and we think about pharmacotherapy, we spend so much time talking about anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and such like that. Do you want to talk about AI? Do you want to talk about ML? Do you want to go down this whole pathway in terms of that? I don't think so, but at what point do you need to bear information and scientific background to establish a mechanism of action or how to use a DTX product? So philosophically, I do struggle what is going to be needed going forward. I think right now, based on where things are coming and what I would say pie my sky, you know, five to 10 years out that um, digital health before it becomes mainstream, I think just introductory knowledge right now about what this stuff is, is satisfactory. If students have a natural affinity that they actually think that this is something they want to get into, then you can curtail them into actually going down more of this knowledge base. And there's different pathways for that, I feel like. Um, a lot of people focus on digital health mainly on the business side. Uh, I think there's a lot of clinical side and I've been asked to recommend people for uh, positions or you know, how do I get into like working for like an express scripts that's doing a digital therapies formulary? Like who are people that can help you know, review apps? So they think it's gonna be individualized approach from that perspective right now. Um, jumping into digital health, there's, there's so much out there. Like it, it is a knowledge wall that is going to have to be um, undertaken. And also class uh, collaboration, working with other professions, whether it's people that's in development for you know, making programming, whether it's engineering, uh, biomechanical, uh, biomedical, such that this stuff is falling under, regulatory, regulatory it's, it's, it's huge. The benefit of it being so huge is there's huge, there's a large number of opportunities. The disadvantage is the fact that you can overload in terms of what do you want to fixate on. So I know that's not a great answer for you, uh, Dave, but that's kind of how I look at it right now. Thank you. Uh, I see some. Okay, Hey, Shanika, and I was wondering if I can ask a question. Go for it. By the way, great talk. I love this. Uh, of course, we cannot train students on all these different dimensions. If there's a core set of skills that we can train our students on uh, so that they are better prepared for this digital health future, is there any way that we can kind of name some of those skills? So some of my some skill sets I do come up with is probably a shift of thought of around intermittent care to continuous care. That's gonna be one of the biggest things. Um, how to identify what makes sense clinically. Like, here, like here's my greatest example. I'm gonna talk about CGM. So if we talk about like CGM and you say, oh yeah, you can monitor blood glucose in like, you know, real time, blah, blah, blah. That, I, that's actually not true. It's we, for those that follow CGM, no, it's, not, it's measured differently. But if I was to talk about, you know, Freestyle Libre 2 versus a Freestyle Libre 14-day system, system versus a Dexcom 6, okay, two different manufacturers. We got Abbott, we got Dexcom, you know, um, and 
the devices themselves work differently. One is actually a flash reader that goes on the back of your arm. The other one's something that goes on your stomach that actually in, uh, incorporates the real time. Setup is very different for both of those different platforms. And actually Freestyle Libre 14 based system actually integrates with a reader uh, to get the information in an app. Freestyle Libre 2 only uses a reader and can't actually incorporate with an app because it's still under FDA evaluation at this current time. They also have different ways of actually detecting and uh, telling you you have hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia is actually from Freestyle Libre 2 actually uh, discerned from a Dexcom 6 is discerned. From Freestyle Libre 14 day system, it doesn't actually track hypoglycemia and tell you in real time. So you may be like, why are you telling me all this information? I'm just giving you a small subset that if you don't have the capability of actually reading through this information, understanding, and then actually drawing out the clinical ramifications of it, then it's going to be pointless because I would not recommend then for a patient with diabetes as very high risk of hypoglycemia to use a Freestyle Libre 14 day system, despite the fact it's cheaper. I would say use a Freestyle Libre 2 or use a Texcom 6 because of your clinical situation and such. And we need people to actually look at the technology and say, wow, there's like 15 blood pressure Bluetooth cuffs out there. Which one's best for me? Which one actually makes sense? Because they're all going to lay in different places. I will tell you, most companies right now say cheapest is best, but cheapest may not actually lead to the best clinical endpoint that you actually want. And we've seen that in the clinical studies themselves. It's poor design. And that's because you will have a bunch of people that just look at tech and cost and say, it all does the same outcome. Therefore, it all is fine to use. But the stuff gets muddied in between. And I think it's that clinical knowledge from, that pharmacists have and kind of taking like this whole you know, ability to look at drug information. We have a very interesting way that we look at this stuff. This can actually be applied towards like an app, towards a device and stuff like that. Does that kind of make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Thanks. I think we have um, questions in the chat. If you could hit those next, that would be great. Okay, so Tyler asks, a lot of this technology is really innovative, has great potential by see costs and privacy, which is a whole other discussion being barriers. What do you think would take for a payer to buy in and support this technology, such as digital pill for high risk patients and research alone enough to create that buy-in? So this is one thing I, I, I am a very, very critical of, especially in the pharmacy profession. Um, we are really great at establishing clinical value for what we can do. Like, we don't need to do a lot to show that pharmacists are more than clinically mindful to do and establish care. What we're very bad at doing is establishing the economic value itself. And that's going to be the biggest thing for this technology. It has to show that it delivers on the cost. The lucky thing is cost is coming down substantially for technology. Like it's getting cheap. Unless of course you're trying to build a PC right now and you have to compute with you know, crypto buyers and everything else, you know, trying to mine Bitcoin. That's a completely other different problem. But overall technology is getting cheaper. Overall, this stuff is coming to being linked together. I think when I look at this question about cost, I don't see it being that huge of an issue, especially in the near future. Especially if you look at like a cell phone. People will say, oh, you know, smartphones are so expensive. I can go buy a smartphone. I can go buy an iPhone 7. I can do a lot of this stuff for $30 instead of a, a data plan for that and just give it out to the population. We do that in home healthcare. We do that in other organizations. Um, there is this also thing that people say, um, you know, access to these devices. We have enough data showing that our lower social economic classes and different um, populations actually don't have access to a computer, don't have access to a tablet at home. What they do have access to is a smartphone. Digital first, mobile first is a key thing. The United States government actually went to the whole process. If you look at all their websites, they're designed mobile first because they don't expect some people to actually have a computer at home to actually search up the information. They expect it to look through a smart device. Look at Wikipedia. Why is it when you click on things, you have to drop down the components? It's all about that. We've been doing this for a decade now because we've seen the writing on the wall that this is how people interact with stuff. In terms of privacy, yeah, this will be a battleground. We've seen what Apple's doing with that right now, what Facebook's been fighting back on. Um, the fact that we have to look at Apple to secure privacy through this stuff is really, really concerning, I would say. I expect at some point the government will step in. Um, to what extent, I am not sure. Don't know. I honestly think privacy is kind of dead, to be quite honest, with how things are going. You carry, if you choose to carry a smartphone, you, you already chose to give your privacy. I think that most people don't want to acknowledge it, but that's probably the case. Um, you're already there. <laughs> so uh, unless you decide to build a Faraday cage around yourself, I think you're going to be a little bit out of luck. Um, let's see. I think there's another case under that. Uh, Josh, yes, you can see a lot of pushback concerning privacy. Okay, yeah. 
Oh, what's that? How would you approach this pushback from patients? Again, like if if you have a device, it's already there. I think from my perspective, what I would say is that there are actual digital formularies in dig, uh, a lot of like uh, different companies out there, like the Rx.Health. Um, there's other different systems, either from Haptic or some others, to actually help establish where in terms of services of an app and what they're sharing their data with. Uh, so that stuff exists out there. So there are actually ways to get into it. Like if we're talking to like the American Psychiatric Association, for instance, has a task force that is actually trying to evaluate apps for depression, anxiety, bipolar, et cetera. And it's, on, it's, on, it's online if you want to look into it. John Toros at Harvard's actually running it. And um, they actually will put on there like you know, what data is being tracked and what's used for it. So I could see for us, again, coming back to this, if you want to understand this stuff, you could help actually recommend apps. And if from a conversation of a patient saying, I want an app for this kind of thing. And you say, okay, what are you really concerned about? Okay, privacy is one of them. Let's find an app that you know is very private for you. And this, and we can just say this is what's going to track. And if you're fine with it, great. If you're not, then let's look at something else. Kind of like you know, almost like you know, safety tolerability, tolerability, efficacy, price, simplicity. Now we could probably maybe add you know, another P in there, privacy. Kind of like the evidence-based medicine kind of approach for medications. We can do the same with this stuff too. Um, if you look at adoption of diffusion for patients, so the tech helps them. You use a return investment is enormous. Uh, how about continuous monitoring health will drive costs entirely down for the freight text medical model we have. The FDA is looking at privacy and medical apps, the regulation is coming. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, the, the, the reality is why does everyone care about this stuff? Why are you hearing pharma talk about you know real world evidence or RWE? It's because of the, all this technology. If we can get information, data, and we get some find some way to mine it, like the payoff is long term, is what it is right now. Uh, anyone who's into digital health looking for an immediate payoff is going to is, is, is a fool's errand, uh, unless you have a digitalization of a service that will lead to some kind of value right away, whether it's um, you know software as a service, uh, whether it's um, digitalization of another service, uh, whether it's uh, recurrent buying. You know, example would be like a Keurig machine, like oh, I, in order to use a pot and use the machine, I need pods, and they're making money off the pods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Feel free to ask any question. Well, actually, I have another question. Um, you went through a lot of these digital, digital products that are out there, um, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on extended reality and what you can do uh, with extended reality in the realm of digital health. I am sorry, you are breaking up really badly. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, virtual reality, extended reality, and virtual reality? how it Yes. Yeah. So virtual VR, there's, there's a there's a lot of studies actually out there on VR technology. There's actually um, a lot of information. People are using it, especially for pain uh, and um, mental health. I think those are two areas I've seen a lot of emphasis on. Um, there is a oh, I'm trying to remember. There's actually a book if you're interested that came out about two years ago. If you message me offline, I'll I'll find it for you. And he's a physician that's very into the pain management using VR technology, especially like for children. You go into ER, instead of getting the medications, you put a VR headset on them. Um, they get to experience different things like that. People are using it for like hospice palliative care and such. So I think the value of VR is pretty high. I think my biggest problem, again, with VR technology is the cost point for the hardware itself is pretty expensive um, at this current time. And I feel like the form factors are still under development. Um, that's one piece of hard, like I was talking before, you know, what comes after a smartphone? I feel like if you're thinking about a VR, AR integrated world, uh, I still, I, I think it's quite a way away. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and for those answers. If um, anyone has any other questions they want to ask, feel free. But, um... If not, I think actually, why not? I, I, I have another question. Good. You have a digital uh, student digital health lab running out of uh, out of your school, right? No, I wish I did. I wish I did. There's only Was a few. It, uh, Ravi that has it. Ravi Patel has a small one running. He actually, I think, had a bigger one before. Um, Robert Puglisier out of um, mm -hmm. Jefferson. Um, 
he has a um, a uh, lab that he works in. And he's like he's like an assistant director for. It. They're very focused on three D printing and stuff like that, but also a lot of user centered design stuff. So he's probably a good one to write. He works with Banku. They have a good book out there from um, Ellie Lipton, I think it is, about design thinking in healthcare. Highly recommend that. Uh, there's a few other schools around the U.S. I think that are piloting or looking into it. Another one is in Florida. I think it's under Dean Sneed. Um, they have a pharmacy that they call a digital pharmacy that they've been working with. And they're trying to like, prescribe apps to patients and such. Very much academic in nature, but uh, that's one that's been around for about four years at this current time. Uh, Miranda Amon previously, I think, was running that as well. Um, there's been a few other uh, schools that I think from their rotations are playing with RPM services, especially around hypertension and such. I've seen them publishing this stuff or presenting the posters at AACP over time. Um, West Coast always, they think UCSF, you know, the default in those areas. Big tech uh, hubs. Uh, the other one would be like Lipscomb. Um, Kevin Clausen's a big person, I think, and Beth Breeden uh, with the use of um, blockchain. They're interested in that stuff, mm -hmm. but they actually have huge block, uh, digital background as well. Um, again, a lot of stuff with data and such, how to manage it. So select schools, I think if they had the local um, support and I think if their leadership thinks this is a value, and I would say this is very much a cultural thing. Um, I expect universities that have a good culture accepting this stuff will be uh, 